Awesome. God bless the exes. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome everyone tonight. Um, glad you're here. Welcome everyone tonight. We are so glad you're here. Um, we're going to start um, as a pastor and just as believers. We always start everything with the word of prayer, especially as Republicans. Um, and I'm going to ask my good friend, Pastor Marty Reed, to come up here and lead us in a word of prayer. All right, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for, that, for the day. We thank you for this opportunity together as, as believers. Uh, we thank you for the form of government that you have given us where we get to choose who our, who represents us in the different governmental positions. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing, and I'm afraid so many people take it for granted. So we ask the Lord to help us uh, keep the precious, preciousness of the right to vote at heart at all times. If, uh, if just half of the Christians in this country voted in every single election, we could control every election that ever happened going forward. And so we pray, Lord, that you would bless this meeting. We pray that you would bless Josh and all those who participate and speak. And uh, we ask you, Lord, to give us favor to go before us, that we can take Kaufman County back and be a, a truly conservative, Christian conservative county once again. Bless, bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Marty. Um, Jason, I'm going to borrow you. Can you come stand over here since you got on a flag shirt? We're going to use your shirt for our pledge, for our pledge to our, the greatest country in the world. So if you would stand and, and join me in, in saying our Pledge of Allegiance to, to Jason's shirt, <laughs> which is going to represent our flag tonight. Our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jason. Now, uh, Councilwoman Singletary, she has a Texas flag on her shirt, so we're going to utilize her. Come on, Councilwoman. She's a city councilwoman over in Ball Springs, so we're going to utilize her shirt for our Texas flag tonight. <laughs> Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. God bless. Amen. God bless Texas. You may be seated. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I, I'm honored to be here in Kaufman County again. Most of you guys know who I am. For those that don't, I'm Troy Jackson. I am a uh, pastor, uh, biblical citizenship pastor over at New Beginnings Church in Bedford, Texas. Um, I am a precinct chair trainer and candidate trainer. I am a political strategist. Um, I am a lifelong biblical Republican, and so I always make that known. People that know me know I always throw the biblical in front of that. And so I want to encourage you as we get into this tonight, whatever candidates you, that you're looking into up and down the ballot, don't look at them because they profess to be a conservative. Don't look at them because they profess to be a Republican. But look at their biblical values. Because you can be a Republican all day long and not have biblical values. You can be a conservative all day long and not have biblical values. We have to be word led by the word of God. And if we're in here and we're saying we're believers, and, and even if you're watching online and you're saying you're a believer, and you're voting for people that don't have biblical values just because they have an elephant or a donkey, but they have no biblical values, you are voting against yourself and you're voting against your God and you're gonna be held accountable when it's all said and done for how you, you, you share that vote in that stance. Yes, come on, brother. Come on, preacher. A preacher can never resist the chance to get a mic. <laughs> I, I go across the state, I'm a, I'm a pastor too, I go across the state and preach a message, I did it last night in Tomball, Texas about the Black Robe Regiment. And I always open by saying the statistics of Christians voting Yes. Uh, there are supposedly 80, you can't hear? You can't hear me? You can't hear me? Man, I didn't even know I needed a mic. So supposedly there are 80 million evangelical Christians in America. Half of those are not even registered to vote. They have absolutely no say in any of the political process. 
The half that are registered to vote, only half of them actually vote in any given election. But to his point, only half of those that actually vote, vote biblical values. Yes. When you do the math, that's 12.5% of Christians who are participating in the, one of the most precious gifts God give us, which is the ability to elect people to represent us, people that have our values. In Texas, I am sick to death of rhinos. Who, who, who tell you they're Republicans, but they're Republicans in name only. They don't vote, they don't vote the party, they don't vote the party uh, platform. platform. I'm a, I'm a, the only reason I'm a Republican is because I agree with the platform. And I want people that represent us to vote for the platform. Amen? Amen. Amen. And you know, I'm going to share something with you quickly that um, a, a, a friend of mine, Pete Sessions, shared with me. And he, he'll probably cringe at the fact of me sharing this with you guys. But he said something very unique to me when I was with him in D.C. not too long ago. He said, you know, I no longer be here in D.C. again this time in his new district. He said, I no longer call them rhinos and conservatives and Republicans. He said, what I, the, the line is clear now that what we have are believers and unbelievers. We have those that believe the word of God, and we have those that don't believe the word of God. And he said, that's where the line really is in the sand. And he said, and he, and he challenged me as I go out to help people understand what he's experiencing there as he's talking to people. They have their warped view of the word of God. And they make the word of God conform to what they want in their position. And then they tell you, I'm a Christian. And so now we have to ask, you may be what you call a Christian, but are you a biblical Christian? Which means, do you hold true to biblical values? And so I'm honored tonight to be able to endorse and support a dear friend of mine that is running for the Texas House. And I can firmly stand and say that Joshua is a biblical Christian. I want you to help me get the word out all across Kaufman County that you have not somebody that has been endorsed by all these people or because it's not about the endorsements, it's about the values. So we talk about protecting our borders, we talk about ending property taxes, we talk about protecting our children, we talk about defending our, our, our right to protect our homes and our families with the Second Amendment. All of those things are biblical in nature. So I can say I'm a conservative, but if I don't hold true to the word of God, does it really matter? If I'm saying I'm a Christian, should I really cast my vote for somebody that doesn't hold true to the Christian, biblical Christian values that I hold true to? No. So only give your votes to and only support and walk and, and block walk and phone bank to, for those that have true biblical Christian values. And so I want you to join me in welcoming my good, good, good friend. And make sure you, I want to challenge each of you, before I bring him up, I want to challenge each of you to, to text everyone in your phone. Text every single, I don't care if they live out of state. Text every contact in your phone and ask them to, if they know somebody here in Texas, in his district, that can vote for him and, and volunteer for him to do that. If they are out of state, ask them to give to his campaign so that he can be victorious when it comes to, to March and when it comes to November. Because if you really want to see God do what he wants to do, it's going to take all of us reaching out to all of those that we know and are in relationship with and planting the seed in, because they will sow into what he's doing and what God has called him to do in this season because of their relationship to you. So I challenge you, each one of you has at least two, minimum 200 contacts in your phone. So start with this. You know, you got some people that are just cheap. So I'm going to tell you, every week, send them a text and send them a link to his website and say, give $5 this week. You can do it on Tuesday. I do that a lot. I'll call it $5 Tuesday. I'm challenging you to give $5 on every Tuesday 
to this candidate for this campaign. And I send that to everybody in my phone. So don't say it can't be done because you're looking at, oh, well, I just don't have it. You may not have $100,000 to help him, but you got $5 that you can commit to on Tuesdays to sow into what God has, has called him to do in this season. And if you're standing with him and you're here tonight, I, I know you're standing with him. I want you to just, just, just take on that challenge and send that message to those in your phone and challenge them to step up and do, do more than be keyboard warriors. Put your money where your mouth is. Put your, put your feet and your voice out there so that you can actually see your biblical values being exhibited in the, in the Texas legislature. Amen? So put your hands together and welcome my good friend, Josh. And Josh might even sing for you guys tonight. Love you, brother. Thank you, guys. I want to start with a story tonight. Uh, my children can tell you Brian Kilmeade is one of my favorite authors, and I'm somewhat of a student of history. Um, and when we look at the formation of this country, in fact, most, the, uh, most scholars and historians, when they look at, the, at America, and undoubtedly America is by far the most powerful country in the history of the world. And yet, the America was really, the turning point of America was the Civil War. It was one of the most key wars that has ever been fought. And so, if America is the most powerful country, and yet it, the hinge point of American history is the Civil War, then we go to the Battle of Gettysburg, which again was a turning point for the Civil War. But inside the, the Battle of Gettysburg, there is one little battle that was fought. That was the Battle of Seminary Ridge. And most scholars today would agree that that one tiny battle that was fought there on that little hallowed piece of Pennsylvania real estate is undoubtedly the hinge point of American history. And it's amazing because it was only a few hundred men that was rushing across Seminary Ridge towards another ridge called Cemetery Ridge. And it was that battle that was fought, that one hour battle of hand to hand combat that truly was the axis point, the epicenter of American history. And yet most of us tonight have probably never even heard of that battle because it's seemingly insignificant in the history books. But the scholars and historians would disagree with you. But the amazing thing is this, is that when they would go and they would study the journals of the men that fought in that battle, you want to know what I find very interesting? Is that every single one of them considered it another fight. It was just an ordinary battle. It was nothing to them in their mind of significance. Only history would tell the story of the importance of what they did that day. Now, I realize that you showed up tonight for a debate or a town hall. And I realize that many of you are involved politically. And so maybe in your mind, it's another town hall. It's another debate that Keith Bell did not show up to. But I will tell you tonight is that the battle for the world is happening in America. And the battle for America is happening in Texas. And the battle for Texas is going to happen in Coughlin County. And so one of the greatest questions is people who have walked in, they didn't even wait for Q&A. They asked me, they said, Josh, why are you running? And to be honest with you, it's a great question because reality is, is that I have a lot of things going on in my life. I had just moved to Kaufman County. You'll hear the other side say, well, you're just nothing more than a car carpet bagger. I moved here because I wanted to get away from the city because we have country values. If you were to look at my beautiful wife and six homeschool children, we wanted to get outside the city. I, was, I, I grew up on a ranch. My wife grew up on 1,400 acres up in the mountains, mountains. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a different breed of people that are out in the rural agriculture areas. And so I grew up in an agricultural area. And so these sort of people had different values. So I moved to, to Kaufman County right outside of Forney in a place called Markout Central and six acres of land. And we're putting animals on there, and it's—it's—I mean, it's—it's it's all of our children's dreams. 
Never in my life did I think that 30 days after moving here, I would get a phone call from Ken Paxton. I mean, Ken Paxton's never called me before. And so he calls and is like, I, I understand that you just moved into this area. And I said, yeah, we, we, we love it. Can, can I stop by and talk to you? And I thought, man, he's going to ask me for a check or something. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm racking my brain why the attorney general wants to talk to me. And so as we begin to talk, he shows up. He shows up actually at my offices and, and he sends in, of course, the security that comes in before he does. They pull up in a black suburban. They, they say, we have to sweep your offices, but it's 48,000 square feet. And so I said, well, good luck. Uh, it's going to take you some time. And they said, well, let's just do this immediate area. And so they came in. They swept that area. They open up my desk drawers. They find Chick-fil-A that I had been hiding from my wife that I would stuff down. <laughs> So my secrets were found out. If, 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 if you want dirt on me tonight, Keith, or any of your henchmen that are watching, sometimes I don't tell my wife every meal that I have. <laughs> so the attorney general walks in, he sits down and says, Josh, I realize that you're new to this district, but is there any possibility that you would ever run against Keith Bell? I said, I don't even know who Keith Bell is, but he started to lay out his voting record and he started to lay out his values and the more that I sat there and I listened I said well those don't align with my values and I know one thing I may not have been born in Texas but when I got to Texas I determined that this is the soil that I will be buried in it is the soil that my children will inherit from me and it is the soil that I promise I will shed my blood for if it means fighting for Texas values See, you got to understand this, ladies and gentlemen, Texas is not a location. Texas is a set of values that people around the world aspire to. In fact, when I take this cowboy hat tonight, now full disclosure, I rarely wear a cowboy hat, but if I were to take this cowboy hat tonight, it is a universal symbol of something. You want to know what that is? It's grit and determination and honesty and integrity. This cowboy hat represents values. But you know who should be here in this cowboy hat tonight that's not? Is Keith Bell because he refuses to come here and debate his record because it does not align with the values that Texas is meant to have. So tonight I brought this cowboy hat to sit here as a reminder to people is that he does not show up. He doesn't show up for debates and he does not show up in the house to vote the values that you and I in this room have tonight. He is a no-show. In fact, I wanna say this to Keith because I'll just be honest, even though every political person has told me, Josh, do not bash the other candidate. Don't say mean-spirited things. You stay positive and let the packs do the dirty work. This ugly guy right here on the second row is my dad. And my dad was a rancher, an almond rancher. And you know what he taught me? Is if you're gonna say something about someone, say it publicly and say it to their face. So I'm gonna tell Keith right now, this is not a costume. This is not something that you can just put on and dress Texas and then vote California. No, this is something that you do not deserve to wear because you do not vote. Let me, let me, let me ask you a question tonight. Do you think that a cowboy would vote to fund with your taxpayer money? Do you think a cowboy would vote to fund sex changes for children? Does that sound cowboy to you? Does it sound cowboy to let the government reach in your, in your pocket and vote to explore a mileage tax? Ladies and gentlemen, do you, do you realize tonight that this man, look, if the government doesn't tax us enough, they tax us on our properties, they tax us when we go to the grocery store, they tax us out of our paycheck. You know, we had a Boston Tea Party for a two penny tax. It is unrighteous the things that the government's doing. And not just taxes, you have to have a license and permit. I'm about to build a fence. My father-in-law's in town, and we've got six acres that we want to fence in. Do you know that the government says that you need a permit to do that? I don't think so. I'm not pulling a permit to put a fence on my land. And yet somebody like Keith Bell thinks that the government should reach into your pocket and take all of your hard-earned dollars. I say not only should we, should we uh, 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 end any sort of mileage tax, which thanks, thank God never got passed, but we need to end property taxes. I 
do not believe that you can own your home and then you should rent your home from the government for the rest of your life. I think that is unrighteous and that is not the American dream. It's not the American dream that you and I signed up for when we put all of our, I mean, they, they continue racking up debt in our name. Now every single American citizen, including my kids, owe China $100,000. You know, one of the first things that I want to do is I want to make sure, you see, because the one thing that they want to do is they want to tax you until you can't pay it. And when you can't pay it, your home goes right to the auction block at the county courthouse. And you know who's standing there waiting to buy it? Chinese hedge funds. Not only should China never be allowed to purchase any land in Texas. Do most of you realize tonight that we have literally leveraged our national parks? That our national parks are collateral for the debt that we owe China? China owns our national parks. Yes. And it's being done under our nose. Now, let me tell you the bad thing about me. For anybody that keeps sitting here tonight, grab a pen and paper because I'm going to give you all the bad stuff about me. Number one, I'm overweight. I'm 300 and none of your business pounds in four ounces. <laughs> but I'll tell you something about being overweight, is you have to have a strong backbone, which is one thing that Keith does not have. How do you change your vote 159 times? Do you know that there is one organization, because Keith Bell set a record of 159 changed votes? Now, let me explain to you what a changed vote is. That means that you vote one way on the floor, and then you run before midnight in the secret shadows of the house, and you change your vote with the recorder. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's normal sometimes for people to change their vote two or three times in a session. Keith Bell did it 159 times. You want to know why? Because much like the Pharisees, he wanted to stand over here and proclaim one thing and then go change it when nobody's watching. I'll promise you one thing. If you send me to Austin, I'm going to walk in. If you can't tell by the night, I will be the loudest guy speaking in that room. Why? Because you deserve a voice. If you think this is about me, I promise you this. I, in fact, I waited over an entire month when Kim Paxton was asking me to run. I waited over a month because I did not feel like doing it. I have a lot of things going on. America First News, we've hired Carrie Lake. and Grant, we've, we've, we're, we're, we're building a news platform because we're tired of fake news. We built a family network because we're tired of our kids getting in, inundated with transgenderism and, and homosexuality and being inundated with these things. And so we're over here building platforms. It took me a month, but in the very last moment, my prayer was that one of my heroes, Stuart Spitzer, would, would run again, or that Marty Reed would run. I mean, I'm sitting back and I'm, I'm, I'm like, please. But you know what? These guys have been in the fight. And so finally, my wife looks at me and she says, babe, you know Ray Myers and Valerie? All those people we met, Larry and his pecan pies and all these precious people. She's like, look, Keith Bell is lording over all these people. Aren't you going to go fight him? And you know what? If there's one thing that I have from being picked on as a kid, it's I have David and Goliath syndrome. I hate bullies and I hate people that don't represent. They act one way and then they don't do what they say that they're going to do. So I'm, I'm not here tonight and promising you that I'm going to be victorious in this race. Because if I were to be honest, I'm not running to win. Now, I'm praying to win, and I'm fighting to win, and I'm doing all this stuff. You want to know why I'm running? I'm running because someone needs to, and I want my children to see that whatever happens, Daddy did the right thing. And you know what? If he knocks me out in round one, I'll be right back in round two. Because if there's some Cinderella man inside of me, it's just one thing I promise you, is we are not going to go down without a fight. That's not the way the Fierstein's do it. That's not the way Texans do it. And that's not the way people from Kaufman and Henderson County do it. Somebody say amen. amen. You hear that, Keith? Because I know you're watching. So let's talk about some of the issues tonight. One of my big problems with Keith is that I feel like he has become a voice or an echo and not a voice. 
There is a biblical story of Moses and Aaron. Moses was a man that had a relationship with God, but he had a stutter. He, 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 he was not pro 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 proficient in his speech. And so he was appointed by God, Aaron, to be a mouthpiece or an echo. He was the voice and Aaron was the echo. The problem is, is that Aaron knew how to play the part, but he did not have a relationship with God. And so now, when Moses goes up to the mountain, and God is communing with Moses, but he's up there for quite a while, now the culture begins to talk to Aaron and say, we want a golden calf. So what does Aaron do? Because Aaron does not have a genuine relationship with God. He's just a mouthpiece. He knows how to talk real good, and he's a smooth talker. But when it, when it really comes down to it, he's not the man. Moses was the man. And so Aaron begins to echo back to the culture what they want to hear. Now, I'm going to be honest with you tonight, is I feel like Keith Bell has been nothing more than an echo. The problem is he's not echoing what you want in the house. He's echoing what Dave Phelan wants. I told... Every political consultant said, Josh, don't make insinuations. I'm going to make insinuations tonight. Now, I'm not standing up here and saying that I have factual proof, but I have been told that it exists and that it's coming my way. I'll just say this, and this goes for all of Austin. I'm not just talking to Keith Bell tonight. I'm going for all of Austin, which has become a swamp. And you know what President Trump says? I'm telling you, we got to drain the swamp because there's a lot of losers there. Let's be honest, there's a lot of losers there. Really <laughs> When my wife and I bought this little farmhouse in Marcotte Central, when we got inside, we thought, well, we just got to do a few superficial things. But reality is, when we got under the cabinets, we realized there had been a leak and there was some rotting going on. And when we pulled it out, we found more stuff and we found more stuff. You know what we ended up having to do? We ended up having to spend a lot of money to remodel the entire house. Why? Because it was 30 some years old. Ladies and gentlemen, Keith Bell has been in politics for 30 years. He's been in the school board, he's been president of this, he's been president of that, and now he's in the house. You know what happens to things when they've been around for too long? They start getting a little rotten. And you know what you gotta do? You gotta rip them out of the house. And I'm telling you as the son of a construction worker and a general contractor, I'm here tonight because we need to remodel the entire house. It's not just me, but it's every one of Dave Phelan's henchmen. It's every person that voted against Kim Paxton. These guys have got to go. Do you want to know why? Because they vote. And here is what they do. I'm going to expose a few things tonight. They vote Democrat chairs. Now let me explain to you the importance of that. Now, they want to play it off like, well, it's bipartisanship. We do it because we want to show the other side and bring them over to us. And the, that is baloney. You want to know why they do it? Because the chair is going to decide which bill gets out of committee and goes to the House. What they're actually doing is they're buying themselves a smoke screen as to why they don't actually have to vote on anything conservative because they can say, well, the chair never let it out of the committee. You want to know why they never let it out of the committee? Because your pansy, limp, wristed rear and put them there for that exact reason. I'm not going to say bad words because I'm a good Christian man. But I'm telling you, I'm thinking them right now. I'm sick and tired of this. I did not move to... Now, uh, I told you, I'm going to tell you the bad stuff about me. The number one thing that you're going to hear Keith Bell say about me is simply this. Josh was born in California. <laughs> it's true. All that means is you were born here if you got here as quick as you could. I love this man. <laughs> so Keith, Keith hit me with phone calls. Do, do you realize he was born in California? So can I tell you a little secret about California? And this is going to be offensive at first, but hear me out. There are lessons that every single Texan can learn from Californians. And it's this. In 1981, when I was born on an almond ranch, right outside of Turlock, California, because that's what we were. We were almond ranchers, and my dad owned a construction company. We were born in the agriculture 
capital of California. And you know what's amazing about that area? California in 1981, most people don't realize, was conservative. Yes, it was. We had a conservative governor, a conservative legislature. We were a conservative state. We were red. Yes. We were the home of Reagan. Yes. But ladies and gentlemen, 40 years later, it's nothing more than a cesspool of stupid liberal ideas. Now here's what I want to challenge you, Keith Bell. You want to call 10, 20, 30,000 people and say, how can you vote for him? He's from California. Let me, let, me, let me say this. You want to know why California is blue now with all of the stupidity and cesspool that is everything happening in California was one reason. Somewhere along the line, weak Republicans elected Democrat chairs. I'm not even talking to you now. I'm talking to Keith. Keith, the reason that California is blue is because of spineless politicians like you that were more worried about being popular than they were standing on principles. And ladies and gentlemen, I do not want that to happen to the great state of Texas because this is the last battleground. This is the crown jewel that the liberal leftists want more than anything else. They want to take out Texas because if they get Texas, everything else is gonna fall. So if you wanna know tonight why I'm running, I'm running for one simple reason, is this is the land that I plan on dying. I was offered, my wife can tell you, I was offered in a business deal between 12 and $15 million to move to Miami, Florida. True? Know what I said? No. They looked at me crazy. What? Are you kidding me? I said no, because Texas shares my values. This is where I want to be. This is where I want to raise my kids. And I turned out more money than I could have ever imagined in my life to be on one of the most popular podcasts in all of America for one simple reason. We loved Texas more than we loved money. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I will promise you this. We are going to fight and we are going to fight hard. And if it takes the next couple of months or if it takes the next couple of years, I promise you, we're going to remodel the house. And it's gonna start with two better. So I promised you tonight, number one, I want to take an opportunity to take questions. And I want you to give me your hardest questions. Uh, I'm not here to run away. I'm not here to shy away from anything. But I want to, and tonight we were going to play the audio, but we are redacting the lady's voice that is on the audio because she has fear for the safety of her family. We're, re we're redacting that and we're going to be releasing it to the news media. But... There was a very concerned citizen that brought to me a voice recording that she took of a one hour and eight minute conversation that she had with Keith Bell. And I'm telling you, it was juicy. So tonight, you're going to hear it here first. Now, I, can't, I can imitate Donald Trump, I can't imitate Keith Bell's voice because I have too much testosterone. But I want, to, I want to repeat tonight some of the quotes that Keith Bell said on that phone call. And these were literally dictated word for word. The first starts like this. He's speaking of Greg Abbott. He said, he's a lot like Trump. You know what I mean? Just way off the reservation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, does that sound like a conservative Talking about the most conservative president, at least of my lifetime. But then he goes on to start talking about the Second Amendment. Now it's interesting because he claims, he claims that he is one of the most valiant warriors and defenders of the Second Amendment. But I'll show you now, as Maury Povich used to say after the paternity test, we've determined that is a lie. 
None of us in red districts are going to vote for red flag laws. Even though we agree with it, it's political suicide. Does that sound like a cowboy conservative? Speaking of the Pardo case, many of you are probably familiar with the Pardo case where, where literally a kid was ripped out by the government over a doctor who was upset about getting fired. And now CPS walks in and takes a kid out of a home. Now, of course, everyone's gonna freak out. I may have people unendorse me after this, but this is great. I'm gonna say this, CPS, you come to my home, you will be met with the Second Amendment. Here is what Pete Bell said about the Pardo case. You know, there's some of these things where it just doesn't serve a purpose to do anything because you're putting a noose around your neck and asking someone to pull the lever. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of his constituents that he is supposed to be representing and fighting for. But he's not worried about fighting for the person, the little guy. You know what he's concerned about? Political expedience and whether or not it's good for his political career. The one thing that I'll promise you is this. I will always stand on principle. I don't want the job, but I'm going to fight for the job. And I'll promise you this. The minute that there's somebody else that's going to do a better job, I will gladly hand it off. In fact, maybe I should go ahead and limit myself to a certain number of years. The, the first thing that I told my wife, I said, babe, I said, when we go to Austin, I'm not going alone. We're going as a family. You and the kids for two months are going to live with me in Austin. She said, but what about all the animals? I said, we'll hire someone to take care of the animals. But what about, you know, the kids' rituals and their routines and all these things? I said, honey, let me tell you something about Austin. The first thing that happens when you show up is they come knocking at your door with women, with booze, with cocaine. I was going to say blow, but some of you don't know what that is. Cocaine or money. And they offer you whatever it is that you want. But the minute that you take it, well, they own you, ladies and gentlemen. And so if you ever have a conservative that campaigns as a conservative but doesn't vote conservative, maybe you should ask yourself what they have on that individual. Come on. Was it the money? Was it the women? Or is it the power? Now, I, I just want to ask you this. Keith Bell has already said that he's willing to spend $2 million of his own money on this election. Now, some would consider that commitment. But for a job that pays $7,000 a year, I have got some questions about that. Come on. I have some questions about why you would spend $2 million for a job that pays $7,000. Unless somewhere along the way... <coughs> I'll just stand over here and sip my tea. So here is what he says in regards to the Second Amendment constitutional carry. This is his direct quote. At the end of the day, you can't get elected in our district, district if you don't support that. It's a no-brainer. Whether or not I think everybody should be walking the streets with a 9 millimeter strapped to their pocket looking like the OK Corral, I mean, whether or not I believe it, I mean, if you went to a football game in Athens, Texas, do you think it's really reasonable for everyone to have a six gun on their hip? Would, you, would that make you feel more comfortable? And he addresses the person. I'm just telling you, the average person doesn't feel comfortable with that. Now, you're a reasonable person with little kids. Is that what you want to see? Yes, it is. Because guess what? Now, this, this over here is my, my Uncle Matt, a longtime Texan. And you, because I love listening to the people, my Uncle Matt came to me and he said, Josh, I have a great idea. I said, well, I love great ideas. He said, could you maybe pass it to law or get in there? And what if we were to create a bounty, a reward for people that carried, if they stopped a mass shooter, shouldn't they get some sort of, and I said, wow, that is such a great idea, whether it's the government or the NRA or who. Wouldn't it be awesome if you were rewarded for stopping a mass shooting, how many people would start carrying? You see, Keith Bell doesn't want you to carry because he thinks it makes people feel uncomfortable. Well, guess what? The Constitution does not protect your feelings. It protects my rights. So here is what he said about the Second Amendment. 
I think I've already spotted the Keith Bellites in here. Now, do I have to vote for that? Absolutely. If not, there will be 30 people running against me in the next primary. Keith, it's not going to take 30. I'm just one dude, but I promise you, I'm coming with enough firepower of 30 people. He says this. He said, I do that. I do that at Intex. That's the business he owns. I have 30 odd six signs at my business. It's a private business. Leave your gun in the car. You can't bring it into my office. Ladies and gentlemen, does this sound like a man tonight that supports the Second Amendment, that supports constitutional carry, that supports the things that protect? You see, the greatest amendment is the first because it protects our right to free speech and free thought. But guess what? The First Amendment is nothing unless we have the Second Amendment. So the Second Amendment is designed to protect our First Amendment. And let me say this to you, Keith. Our rights do not come from the government. That's not the way that the Constitution works. Our rights come from God, and it's meant to be protected by the government. The government is not here to lord over these beautiful people. The government is here for one thing, to ensure that their rights are protected. And you, sir, are not the kind of man that want to protect their rights. You want to lord over them instead of serve them. That's why I'm running against you. So I'll, I'll close with this. I realize that we, we're out of here at 8. They're opening up the restaurant. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry. <laughs> Working up a little bit of a sweat. Come on. I want to take some questions tonight. And I want you to think of your hardest, toughest, roughest questions. There's nothing that I'm scared of. So if you got a question, my good friend Troy here, who happens to be single, ladies. Uh, <laughs> If, uh, if, you, if you have a question tonight, just go ahead and raise, raise your hand because I want to hear about the things that matter most to you. So please, pass away. No, no softballs, Marty. Well, I already know you, so I know there ain't no such thing as a hard question. Okay. I want to know what your plan is to get rid of property taxes. Okay, that's actually a phenomenal question. So am I going to sit here and promise you that it's going to happen in the first legislative session? I do not think that all property taxes are going to go away in one session. But I'll tell you what I believe the first step is. Is I believe that you should have the right, when you have paid off your mortgage, I think that A, your property taxes should subside. Or B, we determine an age that says the minute that you have hit this age, you have served your country. You are a citizen of your country. And therefore, you should own your home. Now, the one caveat that I'll put in there is commercial properties. If, you're, if your property is being used for, for commercial business, the first legislative session, we may not get that passed. So I'm trying to give us realistic expectations. I'll tell you the first thing that I will do, the very first session, is I will go in with my colleagues and I will sit there and I will help to author a bill that will do two things, and that is say that when you've paid off your home, that there's no more property taxes, and the government should not have the right to tell you that you have to have insurance on your property either. That is between you and your lender. If your lender requires it, then so be it. But why is the government going to come and tell you exactly what you have to do? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm all about taking the government out of your pocket and getting them out of your lives and not allowing them to mourn over you. That's not their job. So this is what I think would be the most sensible plan moving forward. Now, that's the first step. And as time goes on, I think that we continue finding, for, just get our first first down. And then let's get our next first down. And then let's take a Hail Mary. But I, I, I honestly believe that in just a couple of sessions that we could get to the point to where we have greatly reduced. You see, here, here is the trick that they play on you regarding property taxes. You already got a mailer, I'm sure, from, from Key saying, well, I voted to reduce property taxes. Let me show you how that's a huge facade. He says that, but then guess what? The government has the right to appraise your home. 
So now all they have to do is say, oh, yes, we gave you a little property tax relief. But now your home is worth double what it was because the idiots from out of state are moving in here. And therefore, guess what happens to your property taxes? They go right back up. So I say this, let's make it simple, stupid. End property taxes. It's unrighteous tax in the first place. So, uh, that's a great question. If you can see on the signs, that's one of the things that I say is that we have to defend our border. Wanna know why? Because millions of people are coming across our border illegally. Now, I'll tell you this, I, I am someone that did almost a year's worth of work in Mexico, missions work. We went over there, we built orphanages, I preached in churches across Mexico. I love the Mexican people, I genuinely do. And I see and understand why they're trying to come to America. But ladies and gentlemen, there is a process to chasing the American dream. There is a process. And so, I actually have a commercial coming out that is going to be quite offensive to many people. But let me tell you about this commercial. It's me standing there next to a highway. Behind me is a desert. Across the desert are running a couple of what appear to be Hispanic men dressed in sombreros and ponchos. There is music that's playing that lets you know exactly where they're coming from, Mexico. And guess what? Of course, as the commercial starts out, people think, oh wow, it's a couple of Hispanics running across the desert. Here's the only problem, is that they then get to the highway, jump into a black suburban, to where they take off their sombrero, they're wearing an ISIS headband, and they take off their poncho, and they have a suicide vest. You wanna know why? Because terrorists, ladies and gentlemen, are coming across our border. China is bringing in drugs. See, everyone thinks it's Mexico. Ladies and gentlemen, it's actually China. China is responsible for a lot of the stuff coming across the border. The human trafficking. Look, if millions of people are coming across our border, that is not immigration, that is an invasion. That is why, to me, this is an issue of literal war. I know people say that that is a broad statement. So at the very end of the commercial, I make one very blanket statement. I say this, if you elect me the very first day, I am going to show up on the house floor with a shovel, I will have a pickup truck with wet cement and cinder blocks, and I'm gonna send a very clear message to my colleagues that it's time for us to build a wall. And until the wall is built, we literally need to put, whether it's the National Guard or whoever we deploy, we need to treat our border, because if we don't have a border, we don't have a state and we don't have a country. We need to treat our border as though it is literally a militarized war zone. Because if you look at the, at the fentanyl that's coming across our, our, our border, do you know that there is enough fentanyl in one drug bus to kill every person in the United States of America? Do you realize that one kilogram of fentanyl can kill 250,000 people? You wanna know where the fentanyl is being made? It's being made in China, it's being shipped to Mexico and brought across our borders. That is an act of war and we need to treat it as such. Okay, for those of you that are watching from home, she's asking about school choice, and she's saying that she feels, she's a homeschool mom, that it is a Trojan hoy horse that can actually, and I'm gonna probably, uh, I'm gonna put words in your mouth, but you tell me if I'm incorrect, which would allow the government really to come in and regulate what happens in your home. Okay, very fair question. If you cannot tell, I have six homeschool children here too, all right? I, we have more homeschoolers. In fact, there's probably s several homeschoolers here. So I will tell you right now, I am pro school choice, but let me tell you with one caveat. If you heard what I said about CPS, which I promise you, articles are being written right now coming after me for saying that, all right? But the government's not coming in my home and dictating anything. So I'm not going to vote for anything that has caveats that gives the government oversight. Now. I'm pro school choice, 100,000%, and I'll tell you why. Because I'm a free market capitalist. 
Which means this, is that any time, if there's only one Mexican restaurant in town, it's probably gonna suck because there's no competition. You have to go there. The little town that my, my wife grew up in, all right, they had one Mexican restaurant and white dudes worked in the kitchen. It was horrible. It was not a good Mexican restaurant. There was no competition, all right? And so for me, I say that the money that you pay into the system should follow your child, which means this, if I, if, trust me, I do a better job educating my kids than any teacher could. In fact, the first time that we ever even tried putting them in school, we put them in a Christian school because my wife was having a very difficult pregnancy. And so during that pregnancy, we put them in Christian school. They came home with homework and his homework was ours. I, I went into the PTA meeting, I stood up and I said, hey, what if I told you that homework is not happening in the Fairstein house? They said, what? You don't care about your children? I said, no. Here's the deal. I don't send laundry to be folded in. You get them for eight, nine hours a day. I don't send laundry for them to fold laundry in the middle of your class. If you're incompetent enough that you can't teach them two plus two in eight hours, then I question your ability to teach. But I'll tell you this, there's things that I teach them that you do not, you could not even comprehend, that you do not have the capability to teach my children. And so guess what? When my kids get home, you see, that's, that's the beautiful thing about what we do. I don't plan on my kids going to college. By the time they're 18, my kids are gonna own their own business because that's what we do as an entrepreneurial family. So I told them, I said, I don't care about their grades or their transcripts, but I'll just say this, is that the Fierstein family is gonna have dinner together and we're gonna pray together and we're gonna talk about stuff together. We're gonna watch Little House on the Prairie or Andy Griffith, or we're gonna do something together as a family and you're not gonna dictate what happens in my house. Now, if that's the way I feel about a Christian school, then I hope you understand how I feel about the government. The government is not telling me what to do with my children. They're not your children, Hillary. They're not your children, Keith. They're not your children. They're my children. And so the one thing that I will promise you is this, because my wife would never allow me, is we will not vote for anything that allows government oversight in the home period, bar none. But I do think that schooling will get a lot better when your tax dollars will follow the student instead of automatically go to a school where they're shoving DEI and CRT and radical feminist, feminazi, liberal ideology and agenda of the LGBTQ. I do not think that they should be teaching your five-year-old how to have oral sex with another little kid. That's wrong, and my dollars aren't gonna go towards it, so we need to have competition. And the greatest competition is when we open it up to say, the schools that do the best job, so people have told me, well, you don't care about teachers. Uh, you know, uh, well, uh, of course, the, the teachers unions hate me. But you know what I say? If you suck at your job, then you should not have tenure. If you suck at your job, then you should not be able to sit there and collect a government check the rest of your life. You know what we need? Is people that are fighting, that are literally fighting for those students because they're gonna do a better job educating them. That's where I stand. Well, I, I like the idea of reducing property tax or eliminating, but my question is, where will the funds come from Sure. Very, very fair question. Uh, so I will, I, I will tell you what I think that, that we have done for a very long time is we have given credit cards to idiots. Okay? The first thing that we do, and we've had to do this before because we're entrepreneurs. The first thing that we do is when we realize that, well, we're going to need this money for this, we start cutting. I'm all for cutting. Because I think that there's a lot of stuff, a lot of departments and things that we could eliminate. And I mean, look, why should we be spending money and giving grants to colleges to study if lesbian anteaters get depression, right? Like, why, 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 why should we be granting this stuff? What I think should happen is that we need to go through the budget with a fine tooth comb and say, you know what? You know what? Me, as a man of Jewish descent, even though I'm a very strong Christian, the one thing that we should do, and I think the Jews got right, is we need to cut out the pork, yeah. all right? And there's a lot of pork. There's a lot of pork. There is a ton of bacon, a ton of pork shoulder. There's a lot of pork in a lot of these bills. So what we need to do is we need to get 
I believe entrepreneurs and people that run businesses and people that understand cash flow and people that understand. You see, a lot of times what end up happening is you get a bunch of fat cat good old boys that have already, and, and they get in position, or you get people that have never run a business or don't understand a lot of these things. What we need to get is people that know what it's like. I'm assuming that a lot of you have a household budget, right? Some of you have probably done Dave Ramsey, right? You start looking at the things that you can cut and then you can put stuff over here. So what I think that we need to do is we need to start by cutting stuff because it's ridiculous to me. Now look, I, this may be unpopular because I realize that High school football is a religion around here. Okay? I get that. I love high school football. If you can't tell by my size, I played high school football. But let me tell you this. I didn't play at a $90 million stadium. And you see, people like Keith Bell, they want to build these big things, name them after themselves. In fact, it's funny because Keith Bell Opportunity Central is where people are going to vote in the election against Keith Bell. They're going to a building named after him. But you see, he talks of, oh, no, I don't like taxes. I like cutting taxes. But he was responsible for the property taxes in our district more than anyone else. You want to know why? Because he was the one behind all of the bond measures that people just voted because they lied to you and said, well, it's just a two cent. It's just a two cent increase. It's not a two cent. It's a two cent on every dollar increase. And when you do that 10 times, that's a 20% increase. So Keith Bell has been robbing us blind for decades and then he wants to pretend that he's a champion of the middle class that's baloney so my answer to your question would, would, would be this we start by cutting and then we get guys in there that know how to generate revenue because I think that they're that that the the that Texas and the legislators should be smart enough to figure out how to cut property because property taxes shouldn't have been there in the first place and they're just going to continue to go up and up and up. So my answer is this, we figure it out. To say that I have a 100 point comprehensive plan, I would be lying to you. I just barely got in the race, but I know this, as I went into several different companies and turned them from red to multi, multi-million dollar companies. We took one company from zero to $50 million valuation in less than a year. So there's one thing that I can promise you, is we know how to look at stuff and fix it, and that's what we're gonna do. So thank you for the question. I don't have a full comprehensive plan, but I'll promise you we will start by cutting, cutting, cutting. Have you heard about the new cameras that are being put in that with the capability of reading license plates to stop license or car auto car theft? You know, that's uh, funny because it's starting to sound like more like China. Yeah. Why in the world? Now, look, again, this is broadcast, but I told you. I say, I say what I think. We, uh, you know, I grew up in California. They tried that in California. I moved to Arizona, they tried it in Arizona. Want to know what ended up happening in Arizona? They had all of these cameras they started putting along the freeway until people started shooting the cameras out. They ended up getting rid of them. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is Texas. And I know that there's going to be a lot of people freaking out over the fact that I'm saying this. I'm just saying this. This is Texas. And we got to do whatever we got to do. I don't want the government watching every single place that I go. I don't think that Big Brother has the right to be spying on me everywhere that we got to go. Now, I say this. Before bullets, we do it with ballots. Right? So we need to stop it in the legislature. But I'll, I'll promise you this. Keith Bell wants to charge you a mileage tax. Do you really think he's going to stop anyone from putting a camera up and spying on you all, all throughout town? So, ballots first, bullets next. There's some people in Austin freaking out right now. Senator down there, but we don't have a whole lot of great people down there. 
and we need a whole lot more brave people down there. How do you, why do you think you'll be able to get down there to make that change? That's a phenomenal question. And to be honest with you, so her, her question for those of you that, that, that couldn't hear, she's like, why should we trust you? Why will you not turn into another Keith Bell and go down to Austin and become just like them? And reality is, you shouldn't trust me. You should hold me accountable. I don't know. Like, I'm not saying that for applause. Yeah. Because I'm just Yeah. Okay. So, so, I'm not saying this to pretend like I'm more righteous than anybody. I grew up a young minister. When I got married at 33, I was still a virgin. Why? Because I had made up in my mind that no matter what, and look, I'm a hundred and some pounds heavier than I was then. I was a decent looking dude, right? <laughs> it wasn't that I didn't have any, but I understood as a pastor that I had a calling and a responsibility, not just to me, but to my future wife. And I had a responsibility to the people that I pastor. So I was not one that liked to pastor from the top down because I believe, as the Lord shows in the, in, in, in the Last Supper, to me the most important message he preached was in his actions. And he got on the floor and he served the people at the Last Supper because I believe that the glory is on the floor. Now, to your question, I would say this. The best thing that you can do is look at my record. Keith Bell cannot attack me on an affair. Why? Because I've never had it. He can't attack me on stealing. He can't attack me, like literally, when they set me down, they said, what do you have in your record? In fact, when, when Greg Abbott's political strategist called me, he said, Josh, he said, I find one ticket you had 20 some years ago. I said, well, I, I've got a couple of years, I'm still arguing with the IRS over taxes that I should not have to pay. Which, some of you probably got a call from Keith saying he owes taxes. No, I'm arguing with the IRS over taxes that they're trying to charge me, but I say, I don't owe those taxes. It's ridiculous. So, guess what? I told Paxton as we're sitting there, I said, hey, there's this that he looked at me, he said, Josh, if that's the worst stuff they can find about you, you're gonna be the cleanest guy in the world. So I, I would simply say this, I lived with character and integrity up until I got married, and then I lived with character and, and, and integrity after I got married. Now, am I a perfect man? No, I'm quick to anger. God is still working on that in my life. I'm quick. I, when I see injustice, my first inclination is let's throw hands, right? I'm not perfect. So if you want all the bad stuff about me, I have boobs. I'm a man, I shouldn't have boobs, all right? People in Austin right now are freaking out watching us. I'm just, I'm very, very honest. I need to lose weight, all right? But if there's one thing that I can promise is, I've been faithful to my wife, I've been faithful to my calling to God, I've been faithful to my children, I've been faithful to my family. That's the best thing. Now, do you know what I think the second best thing is? Term limits. How do we stop guys like Keith Bell who can buy elections? Term limits. So, I say let's have that conversation. Is start talking about getting these guys out of office. This, is, this should not be a lifetime appointment. People like Nancy Pelosi should not go in with a couple hundred thousand dollar net worth and now be worth almost a hundred million dollars. Because she's a lifetime politician. When you're making a hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year, I can promise you, I make more than that. I can promise you, you do not become a hundred million dollars. It doesn't happen except for corruption. So best answer is let's set term limits. Maybe it's four years, maybe it's eight years, but I am 100% for that. But that's an answer to her question because what she's asking is whatever you did to turn on the screen, I'm all for that. But whatever you do, you're going to have to work with all of these people. And while I appreciate your stances, the question is how do you get people to come over to your side and get them to grow a spine and become more conservative? That's it. Rather than just saying, yeah, we need to get them out. That's great. We kind of stopped. But how do you work with people that are there to get stuff done within that first session? That's it. That's it. Okay. I appreciate you clarifying this, 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 this uh, uh, question. Look, 
the most, the, the, the best thing that I can do is to be a shining, leading example. David Goggins says this. He said, it's not the first guy on the dance floor that's dancing crazy. It's the second and the third and the fourth that get everyone else up because they understand that it's okay to be wild and crazy out on the dance floor. Now, I'm not auditioning here for a, a dance troupe, but the one thing that I am auditioning for is we do have some strong conservatives that are already in the house, but guess what? There's not enough of them, and some of them are not loud enough. If you cannot tell by tonight, the one thing that I will be is loud. And I honestly believe that the louder you are and the longer that you can do it and the longer that you can hold your integrity, because I think that that's the other thing, is that when people get to Austin, there is a natural desire, to your point, there is a natural desire for anybody to fit in. People want to fit in. The problem is this, the minute that you begin to acclimate, you know, there's the story of the frog and the pot. They turn it up one degree at a time. But I will promise you this, I have lived as a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And there's one thing that you do not do. In fact, last night I was, I, was, I was in an interview and they said, well, what if you were just to give on this? I said, I won't for one simple reason. My mom had a story that I would read as a kid. And it was, if you give a mouse a cookie, they'll ask for a glass of milk. So you don't even give them a cookie. You don't give them a crumble of a cookie. So the one thing they, the, the one thing I can promise is this, is I stand resolute. And if you refuse to negotiate, and that's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. This, this is my problem. Sorry to preach for a second. But with the modern day church, is that the modern day church wants to negotiate with the culture. But that's now how you see the Methodists flying transgender flags outside of their, 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 their churches. That's why you see the, even the Presbyterian church and so many of these churches that started the right way, but over, the, over time, they, they negotiated. So I say this, my, my promise to you is this, I will not negotiate, and the first time I do, vote me out. Vote me out. The first, the first time, not the second, the first time that I negotiate, vote me out because I'm not worthy of the office, period. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the one promise that I will stand here and make. And, and I feel like I have a 43 year history now of not giving in to what would have been easy, but doing the hard thing instead, except for diet and exercise. So, sorry, what? You said uh, forever home, yeah. Okay, so first, that's a phenomenal uh, question. So first, 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 first thing is this. Our cities are becoming far too overpopulated. If, 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 if you live in Forney, you totally understand what's going on in Forney. I mean, if you want to talk about overpopulation, we don't have the infrastructure for the sort of population that's moving in there. And now, on the very road that, for those of you that don't know, we live at 15141 Markout Central, okay? We live on a long, half gravel, half dirt road with 500 and some acres right across the dirt road from us. You wanna know what was just proposed? Megatel wants to put in over 2,000 homes on five acre, or on 500 acres. They want to put uh, 900 homes and 11 or 1,200 apartments. We don't have the infrastructure for that. So, I one, I think that we need to stop building and continue to allow building to take place in these particular areas. The next thing is this. 
We need sheriffs and constables and law enforcement officers that enforce the law. And if we in Texas need to make more strict and stringent rules, then, sorry? Yes, or, or a DA that doesn't just throw cases out because it's not politically expedient for them at that moment. Or they're more worried about prosecuting this group of people because they don't want to be considered racist or they don't want to prosecute this because this is an underserved uh, uh, community or they, they look we need to have rule of law in Texas it goes back to the cowboy hat the cowboy hat stands for something the sheriff star should stand for something our police chiefs should stand for something but COVID ex COVID exposed a lot of these police ch chiefs and these sheriffs and I'm, if, if your sheriff complied with any of the COVID lockdowns, you should automatically vote them out. But in regards to crime, we need to get tougher and we need to actually hold these people's feet to the fire because that's the only way. My kids would, I mean, Lord, yeah, and, you know, to answer your, your, your uh, question too, I would challenge people to look at my family, to look at my kids, spend time around them, and you can't fake this, right? You can't fake this. The one, the one thing that I can tell you about my, 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 my kids is they were raised with discipline, with love, but with discipline. We need that in the court system again. There's, it's stupid to me that these kids and these people are getting out of jail in one or two days. They're posting bond and then just running back to their same lifestyle. They're repeat offenders. So I'm 100% with you. We gotta crack down, but to be honest with you, it's not just the legislators in the house. That's something that has to be done locally, and it's gotta be done with the sheriffs, it's gotta be done with the DA and the police chiefs. Can, can I lend any sway that I would have with those individuals? Sure, but ultimately it's gonna come down to what, because it's not enough for me to go and help pass a law, right? If it's not enforced. I think we're getting close to our, oh, we are over our time. Uh, one, one last question. Yeah, so, so my, 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 my first answer would be this, is you cut services. Oh, so, sorry? Well, okay, so my argument would be is that the pork that they're putting inside of your property taxes are paying for something, right? So what we need to do is we need to get into the budget. Now, have I went through the budget with a fine tooth comb? No, but I can promise you this. I've been around long enough to know that there's plenty of pork in there. And the first thing that we need to do, Dave Ramsey would agree, is you need to go in and you need to cut out everything that is unnecessary. I'd probably start with CPS, okay? But you need to go in and you need to cut out all the bloviated spending. And then how much of our money? Do you realize that there's 400,000 Veterans that are waiting right now for an appointment at the VA. Do you want to know who the VA is serving priority right now? They're serving immigrants. Okay, they're serving illegal immigrants. Now, if you if you want to talk about pork, yes, yes. If you just go Google illegal immigrants versus veterans at VA, tons of articles. I read one today actually. There's a ton of articles talking about that. Now, it seems to me, I can't tell, my eyes are not that great, but it seems like you served. Yes. Okay. okay, so if you've got four, if, you, if you've got 400,000 people that are waiting for an appointment, and I'm happy, I am happy to follow up with you, I'll send you all those, those, those articles. 
why are we providing all these services to illegal immigrants? That's probably, in fact, that's my, that's my promise. That's the first thing that I would cut because it's ridiculous that you're paying your property taxes and you're paying taxes in general. We're, we're right there, I'll pay an overage fee, okay? You, we, you're, you're, you're paying your taxes, but they're not going to you. They're going to illegal immigrants that are coming across the border by the millions. And guess what else those illegal immigrants are doing? They're competing for the labor in here that is literally raping your wallet and your wallet and your wallet and your wallet. And they're taking jobs. They're taking jobs that are meant for the people in this room. So if you want my first step of exactly what I would cut, I'm going to start with CPS because I think it's baloney. And number two, I'm going after all of the illegal immigration stipends that we're paying out to all, all, all these people. Greg Gavin and I do not see the eye, uh, eye to eye on everything, but you know what? I'm thankful for a man that at least had enough hair on his chest, even though we don't see eye to eye on a lot of stuff, to actually ship people up to Martha's Vineyards and all these Democrat strongholds and let them experience. Someone just showed me an article in Massachusetts, they're the government is telling the citizens to take illegal immigrants into their homes. Why should I open my home up? The border should have never been opened up in the first place. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I do not have Keith Bell's $2 million. Therefore, I'm already going to pay an overage fee. But uh, we want to thank Penny again and Rust and Rell for having us. We're going to come back here, I believe, for our election thing. Really quickly, as we close, uh, Valerie Villarreal. Valerie, Valerie. Okay, Go ahead. Valerie is running. I have experienced in the last few weeks how corrupt even the GOP is in this area. Yes. And Valerie is running to help fix that. Now, I'm paying for this time, but tell them why they should vote for you in this upcoming election. And you need to put your sign in her yard. Her, her sign in your yard. <laughs> well, I am running to be the Kaufman County Republican Party Chair because I believe in honesty, integrity, and transparency, and those are seriously lacking in our county party right now. I believe everybody's voices should be heard. Our county chair right now um, tells people, sit down, you do not have the floor, you do not have the right to speak, and I don't agree with that. I'm big First Amendment, and... Um, um, I think I can change it. I think I can make a change for the people. So I want everybody to be able to come to the Republican Party meetings and voice your concerns and um, uh, I'll fight for you. In 2014, I um, stood out on uh, an overpass on Dallas North Tollway to celebrate Texas Independence Day and I was approached by um, Homeland Security that told me I can't do this because um, they're going to arrest me and charge me $500 fine. And I said, that's a violation of my First Amendment rights. And he said, take it to court. So I did. And I won that lawsuit in 2015 in federal court. And uh, I'll fight for you just like I fought for you. Yeah. And she's got signs here. The greatest way you can help me, okay, is um, we signs. No, I was going to tell her about tell them about what I found out today. Oh yes. So um, about three o'clock this afternoon, I got a phone call, and um, Ken Paxton has also endorsed. Me. <laughs> Ken Paxton's a very smart man. Uh, Penny's been phenomenal to us. All of the people running for precinct chair, will you please stand? If you're running for precinct chair. Okay, these are the men and women that we also need to support. Uh, precinct chairs in Iowa in a big way. And I go through intros and we will at, at, at future ones. Penny has been gracious. We went over our time tonight. Thank you so much for coming. I'm gonna ask, look, stick around, go to the restaurant. They have generously kept it open. I'm going over there with my family to have a meal. Go to the restaurant, tip the waitress well. We're gonna take care of her well tonight too, but if we wanna move this to the restaurant and then we can sit there, I'll continue taking whatever questions that you want. Uh, but you've got yard signs, we'll pass them out over there. 
Uh, but thank you again for all of you for coming. Please join us in the restaurant. Let's sit down as patriots and, and uh, have a tuna melt. All right? Thank, thank you guys for coming. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, Pastor Troy. God bless you guys. God bless Texas.